Um, hi, everyone. I, I first want to thank you all for such a, an amazing series of talks. Um, I really enjoyed yesterday, and all of the talks this morning have been amazing. Um, I changed my title a little bit last night because I wanted to talk more generally about immersive media as a concept and less about VR specifically. So uh, this is uh, my deal. I'm, I call myself a live performance director. I tend to make work in uh, theater and in opera and sort of digital media installation style pieces. Um, I'm also a professor at Texas State University. Um, I'm part of the, I teach in the MFA theater directing program. Um, and I'm gonna talk today about a piece that uh, I made last year, premiered last year at Lincoln Center as part of the New York Film Festival. Um, and I'm gonna sort of walk you through what that piece was and the experience of that piece and then um, use that as a lens to kind of talk about the stuff that I learned from making that piece and some ways in which um, it could be helpful for you if you're thinking about making um, immersive media style projects. Okay, so uh, the piece begins with uh, you, you buy a ticket and you have to sign a waiver for all of you lawyers. Um, there's a waiver before you can see the show. Um, and you get taken on an elevator ride down into a basement and walked down a hallway and then someone opens up a door to a room and all they say to you is, and here is your office, have a good day at work. And they leave you in this windowless cubicle room um, uh, alone. Um, and so you, uh, you, you kind of like approach the office cubicle and you sit down in the chair and it's clear that this office is not your office, that it's been inhabited by someone else for a long time. Um, but when you look at the computer desktop, uh, there are emails that are addressed to you, to your name. Um, and uh, they say things like, oh, hey, sorry, I'm at an offsite today. Could you just uh, take care of some, some of this work? Sarah Jane left the documentation in her desk somewhere. I'm sure you'll figure it all out. Um, and so that's how this piece begins. And it's a piece uh, that I made with two of my good friends and collaborators, uh, Asa Wember and Michael Yates Crowley. Um, and the piece is called Temping. Um, and that's basically what it is. You temp for 45 minutes. And in the process of doing that, um, there's a whole sort of elaborate story emerges from that experience. Um, it began as an attempt to try to make theater without using any actors. Um, I had been working a lot with actors and I'd been directing operas, which was like a ton of people, and I got frustrated and tired, and I said, our next show will be actorless. Um, and everyone thought I was insane, and everyone told me that this was a terrible idea, um, but I wanted to see if I could try to create a narrative experience, a, a theatrical experience, um, using the the, the tools that we have in offices today and, and to start thinking about how people communicate in offices and, and how to use the, um, those as storytelling techniques or as storytelling, um, I call them like surfaces or um, affordances. And I really sort of narrowed it down to four major affordances. Um, the majority of the show happens in email, that uh, different characters who work at this company email you and you can respond to them, um, and they're sort of narrative branches depending on how you respond. Uh, we created a whole fake phone, corporate phone tree system um, that sort of like led you through different aspects of the company if you were interested in that. Um, and then we also employed a sort of one-way communication system through the laser printer that was in the office. Um, and then I also really considered that the, the built environment to be a storytelling surface and uh, a way in which we could use, if you got really interested in digging through the desk or the bookshelf or the other objects and spaces um, in, or objects and places within that space, that there were a whole series of um, Easter eggs that sort of led you through a narrative there. Um, but the majority of the show happened in email, um, and the majority of the show happens through how you imagine people who you never 
actually meet. And there was a whole cast of characters, uh, and I, we had about four or five different um, branching narratives that sort of depend on uh, moral choices that you as the audience member have to make about how the company is behaving and whether or not you're going to agree with what the company is asking you to do or if you're going to sort of rebel against that and, and these sort of moral choices that you have to make. Um, and I wrote a piece of software that sort of controlled all of that uh, back end that would allow for multiple email accounts and simultaneous sendings of things and help sort of score the way in which the narrative worked. Um, so really the heart and the, but the heart of the show um, lay in, in the actual work that you were asked to do. Um, and, and that is what sort of propelled the narrative forward as you were doing this work. Um, and so this is the real, the real bit of the show, um, which is a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Um, what you were asked to do uh, as you started working for this company and sort of figured it out pretty quickly uh, is to update employee databases and update um, whether or not people were still working for the company and alive or dead. And basically you would just get emails from your boss, and this is like a real job that actuaries have to do all the time. Uh, you would get an email from your boss saying like, oh, employee number 891 has uh, just passed away, could you, update this employee, the database, um, so that we can start recalculating um, their pensions and uh, life insurance and that kind of stuff. And so you'd do that, you'd open up this Excel file, you'd find number 891 in this enormous database, and as soon as you pressed return on changing their status from active to deceased, this weird thing would happen. Um, the lights in the, in the cubicle would start to change, and this quiet music would begin to play, and your printer turns on, and it prints out a picture of that person's face with a description of, uh, of a moment from their life in, in text underneath. And, and we, we tried to make these little text snippets as human as possible, so you, you would kind of have that experience of, uh, no, they weren't just an anonymous person in a database, that they were real people. And, and we tried to find the most sort of like heart-wrenching moments, so like a, a father watching his daughter learn to walk. Um, and then the second that you would put down the paper, everything would return to normal. Um, the lights in the room restore, um, the music disappears, and if you would email anyone else in the company being like, hey, there's this weird thing happening, they'd be like, what are you talking about? Uh, but the show would kind of continue on um, and you'd get other sort of tasks from your boss. The next sort of level or the next step of it was that you had to calculate life expectancies. And again, these are real numbers and it's a real um, Excel spreadsheet and it's actually surprisingly, because of statistics, surprisingly easy to predict life expectancies. Um, and so again, that same thing would happen. You'd have to calculate out how long an employee would have to live and as soon as you figure out that number and put it into the Excel spreadsheet, the lights change, your printer turns on, you'd see their face and have to sit with that knowledge of like, oh, this person only has 15 more years left to live. And, and I see them now as a, a person in a way that I never saw them before. Um, and then we kind of give you the option to calculate your own life expectancy. Um, so, and a lot of people end up doing that and so then they kind of have to live with that number. And the piece ends with you after a, a series of sort of uncovering certain um, semi-dubious activities that this company is doing, um, you're, you find out that the person whose desk that you've been sitting in, who if you've dug through her drawers and listened to her voicemails, you've really kind of gotten to know in this weird way, in a sort of strangely intimate way that happens when we sit at other people's desks, um, that she's been let go. And that you're sort of presented, the piece ends with a choice of, um, do I take this job um, or do I like quit and, and quit along with her? Um, and yeah, so that's, that's the piece. Um, and what was funny about making this piece, um, and I was really proud of it and people really, really enjoyed it and responded really well to it, um, but people talked to me about the piece as being a mixed reality piece or a sort of immersive technology piece. And I always thought that was so strange because 
Um, I, you know, my practice is as a theater director, and I, I really think deeply about the language of theater and the performing arts, and I never really considered it to be anything more than an interactive theater piece. Um, but I think most people, when they think about interactive theater, have a lot of really rough or unpleasant <laughs> associations with interactive theater. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit, both now that you understand what this piece is, um, about how the history of theater has been building us towards immersive, um, like interactive entertainment, and that we've been doing this for a long time and we actually have figured out a bunch of techniques and ideas about it that maybe if you're uh, uh, not well versed in the language and history of, of theater, um, and, but you're making VR pieces, this might be interesting or, or new stuff for you. Um, so the, the thing that, I, that got me first into um, theater, uh, well, it got me into the idea of immersive um, style shows is uh, a book that I read um, by uh, Norman Klein where he talks about this idea of uh, scripted spaces, and I, I, I don't. You don't need to like go out and buy this book because I'm about to like summarize the most important part of this book, and it's pretty long and pretty academic. Um, but basically, his main point is just this: that um, architecture, in the way that uh, music does this too, evokes certain feelings in us, and and those feelings. Um, can be part of a, a specific experience, that when you're in a space like this that you think and feel one way versus when you're in a space like this. Um, and so he calls this uh, scripted spaces. And in theater, we've been doing this for a really, really long time. These are examples of medieval pageant wagons, which was a um, theatrical sort of like show that everyone in the Middle Ages would put on once a year. They'd put on a passion play. And these were um, like sort of like parade floats that would uh, show up in the town square. And usually they depicted like heaven and earth and hell um, either stacked on top of each other, like on the left, um, or your right, <laughs> um, or uh, horizontally, and you would have actors on them, and oftentimes these were interactive as well, that participants, that audience members would get pulled into the hell mouth, and it was like a whole bunch of fun and a little bit scary all at the same time. So this idea that um, scripted spaces can create narratives and that there is something uh, in a, a space that can tell a story. And I think so much about how people are thinking about VR these days and the problems of VR that they are sort of stuck in spaces and we have to learn to tell stories with spaces um, is, seems to be like the thing that people talk a lot about when they're thinking about VR. Um, I would look at sort of the history of how theater has been using scripted spaces. Um, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about is about uh, how we manage audience performer or performance uh, interaction. Um, in theater, we have a whole bunch of really set protocols and rules that you know, the audience must be quiet throughout the show, that uh, usually our seats are arranged and oftentimes nailed into the ground so that you're all staring at the same thing. Um, and even when we start breaking some of those rules, so like when you go to see Sleep the More, you can, you're allowed to move through the piece, um, but you're still funneled in terms of your interaction with the piece in ter uh, to only um, see things and only touch things, but not um, talk to anyone. And also, you're given this mask that also limits the interactions that you can have with each other. You also see this a lot in terms of game design, that you're given only a set, a funneled number of choices, either like you can like attack someone, um, or you can have a limited set of conversation options. And, and that's important, right, because uh, it allows for designers to think about how narrative choices could affect things and to prepare a little bit for branching. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I think also now in terms of like VR, the way in which we interact with these things, uh, th our controllers limit us a lot of times to just simply touching objects, pushing, pulling things, um, but 
almost always the interactions are funneled down to a set number of choices that allows for creators to think about, okay, when they do these, when they make these choices, this is what the reaction should be. Um, the, the third thing that I've been thinking a lot about and that um, Temping sort of uh, was exploring is the way in which audience can participate as a character in something. And I've been inspired a lot by this um, performing art tradition that started to come out of the Scandinavian countries um, called Nordic LARPing, uh, which uh, is different from American LARPing where you dress up like an elf and run around in the woods and cast spells. These are about um, crafting a character and a persona that allows for interaction and allows for collaborative storytelling. So this is from a 1920s themed Lovecraftian Nordic LARP, um, but they've also been taking place in theaters where someone will design a specific environment and then characters will come in and tell a story within that environment. And they have a history and a language for talking about um, audience and character and the overlap between those two that I find really, really fascinating. And to like really quickly summarize and condense it all, uh, it's mostly that the player does like provides the simple body, that the character is is um, is the thing that you put on, that it is the mask or the alibi for interaction, um, and that the role is the way in which you relate to the other people within that specific circumstance. And they also have this really interesting um, and beautiful way of thinking about character in that there's a sort of like sliding scale between a character that's really different from you, a, a very differentiated character that's uh, someone who would behave in ways that you never would or be something that you never would be, like a vampire or a dragon or whatever, um, versus this idea of called playing close to home where you and the character are very close and that your um, sense of uh, choice and who you are influences the story and that there's a lot of bleed, as they call it, between character and um, you. And so Temping was an attempt to have that same amount of bleed, that we use your real name, that we're asking you to calculate your own life expectancy because we want you not to become a different character but to actually think about how much time you have left on this earth, what is the kind of work that you're doing, um, and, and how is that meaningful to you? Uh, the, the fourth thing that I wanted to talk about and that I notice a lot in terms of creating immersive um, experiences is the way in which we, we can subdivide uh, or we can use the tools of theater, which there are only really kind of two main tools. You have just time and space, but you can sort of subdivide those into smaller categories and start thinking about those categories as design choices. Um, this list is called The Viewpoints. It came out of a uh, experimental dance movement in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the Judson Church movement. Um, but then uh, Mary Overly and Anne Bogart sort of codified these things into a way of thinking about a theatrical event and a way of talking about or analyzing or critiquing a theatrical event and, and also building this. And these are like, you know, sort of abstract um, sort of categories for how to look at a theatrical event. But people now make work with these categories in mind without necessarily crafting a narrative. Um, and that, uh, that leads to a really interesting um, uh, theatrical slash immersive events. Um, similarly, Alan Caprow was interested in sort of non-narrative based experiences, happenings as he called them. Um, this is from his piece uh, called Eat, which took place in a cave. And in one corner, there were these women frying bananas in a corner. And then in another corner, there were uh, men peeling potatoes. Um, and the audience or the participants would just sort of move through this and were given these fried bananas and told to eat them. And then um, through these sort of abstract experiences, they crafted a narrative that was meaningful to them, that spoke to them. Um, and, and I think that's another way in which in giving, in looking at the elements of theater and exploring them without necessarily a narrative in mind, audiences can craft experiences um, that uh, generate stories or associations or memories for them. Um, and which kind of leads me to my last sort of thought about these things. 
um, about immersive media and immersive media creation is that um, using the audience's imagination is uh, actually the most powerful tool that you have in the theater. And really the ancient Greeks figured this out a long, long time ago. Uh, in, in ancient Greek theater, a lot of the, um, almost all of the plays include um, really kind of like awful death or murder scenes in them. And the technique that um, pretty much from Aeschylus on that the Greeks figured out is to never show it on stage, to always have it occur off stage, and that a, a messenger or a um, or sometimes the person who committed the crime or a witness would then rush on stage and describe it in horrific, upsetting detail, and that the audience's imagination would create these scenes in a much more vivid way than ever trying to replicate the thing on stage. In the same way in Temping, you never meet another person um, and things happen outside of your office cubicle that you will never sort of like see or necessarily understand, but allowing and asking for the audience's imagination in those moments made for really intense experiences for a lot of the audience members slash participants. I don't know how you want to call it. Um, and, and, and oftentimes, because you know, you'd be looking at this person's face and imagining this moment from their life, um, or just reading about these sort of like subtly hinted at um, creepy things that might be happening outside of the room, uh, people's imaginations would like kind of go wild and they would oftentimes end up being like either like really emotionally moved, they would like cry um, or, or freaked out or um, yeah. So th th that sort of experience, the idea that um, you can create um, empathic emotional events from asking the audience to imagine these things as opposed to trying to represent them realistically or create if you're thinking in terms of like VR, like really pure, beautiful, realistic simulations of something. Um, I think the stronger choice, at least when I look at the history of theater and how we've sort of figured out what makes for effective storytelling, the stronger choice oftentimes is to not try to replicate that on stage or simulate that for an audience member, but instead to ask the audience to imagine um, those things. So, uh, that's my talk. Thank you all so much.